Good afternoon. Welcome to a cold and sunny class of entrepreneurship hour with your ever cold and sunny instructor, Professor Frank. Uh, today, as we continue our journey of an entrepreneur, we have an interesting detour in the road. Our guest is a Michigan graduate who began his career upon graduation at IBM and some 30 years later is still at IBM as one of their top executives today. So now some of you might be thinking, wow, Tom, IBM, like big company, what does that have to do with entrepreneurship? Well, what you're going to find out today is that one of the paths that you can take as an innovator is a path within another company or an existing entity. And if you're smart and aggressive and a really, really creative and cool problem solver like today's speaker, the sky is the limit in terms of the impact you can have in a company of any size. I think the content of today's lecture is going to inspire and maybe even scare you a little bit because um, I know it gave me cause for pause. Please give a very warm welcome to a U of M alum and Senior Vice President of IBM, Mike Roden. Good afternoon. Gee, it's dark in here. I can't see anybody. This is, uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here uh, on campus again. I've, uh, I've started coming back on a, on a more regular basis um, to start getting reinvolved with the university. Um, it's one of the, the luxuries you can do a little bit later in your career. You can start to go back to your roots and actually go back and try to feel young again at campus while you're, uh, while you're getting old. But what I would like to do this afternoon um, is talk to you a little bit about a startup that I'm running inside a large corporation. All right, and so I'm gonna give you the context of what large corporations are like, some of the things that happen along the way, and then how I come to run a startup in a large company. So that's kind of the, the gist of this. Uh, and then uh, Tom and I are gonna spend a few minutes talking upstage um, afterwards <laughs> about uh, some of the things that you might be interested in, which is when you build a startup, how do you actually make money off of it by exiting it? Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, my roles across the M&A environment as the person you would exit your company to. Uh, I prefer to view them as entrances as opposed to exits because you would be joining us. But so let's talk a little bit about IBM. Um, IBM, as you may or may not know, is 104 years old, right? That's a pretty old tech company since tech really wasn't a concept 104 years ago. Uh, and I think as you think about um, technology companies, you have to start stepping back and start thinking about companies and what makes companies endure, right? I think a quote from... Uh, Howard uh, Schultz at Starbucks is a good way to start thinking about this. Is it, it, the, really the gist of this is you can't become just about a product or your product. You have to have enduring cultural values in your organization that become part of who you do, of, of what you do and what your company represents. And that's what enables you to go from generation and generation of technologies to get through what um, Clay Christensen calls the innovator's dilemma. Uh, as you go through um, the lifetime of your company. But if you start out 104 years ago and you start out with a product that looks something like that, that was one of IBM's first products. It's probably not one of the things that you would have guessed was IBM's first products. Um, the company name at the time was the Computing Tabulating and Recording Company. Uh, and we built scales, uh, we built meat slicers, uh, we built time recording equipment, punch cards and the time clocks. Um, what did those things have in common? All right. So what they had in common was the core business value proposition that IBM established in 1911 that is carried through to the same core business that we run today. Now, how can that be given the change in technologies over that time? So what was the core business problem that we were working on? We helped companies apply state-of-the-art technology to solve business process problems. That's what IBM did. These tools 
at that point in time were state-of-the-art technology to start to help automate what were inherently manual processes. These systems continued to evolve. They got more automated. The tabulating part of computing, tabulating recording company became the mainstay of the business. Uh, and tabulating equipment became really the first generation of computing equipment. Now, over time, things happen. If you're in the technology field and you're building a company, something's going to happen to disrupt you. And how you react to that disruption becomes important, right? In our case, in 19, well, let me back up a little bit. During the 1920s, we started building electromechanical or mechanical and then electromechanical devices that captured data, tabulated data onto punch cards. People may have seen punch cards in, in history books. They used to actually use them here at the university when I was here, but um, those punch cards were then stored into boxes and that was the data for your program, right? Those da that data was then stored in warehouses and all the boxes were stacked up and all those cards became the first data warehouses. We still use that term today, but they were physical places full of cards, right? Those cards were IBM's profit. We had a classic razor and blade strategy where we sold tabulating equipment, but we made all our profit off of the cards. It's the same business model that HP printers use today with the ink that goes with the printers. The printers are free, the ink costs a lot of money, right? So we were making a lot of money off cards. 1947, one of our research engineers heard something disruptive. And what they heard was the recording of human song voice on a magnetic tape. And they thought about it and said, if I can put voice on magnetic tape, I can put data on magnetic tape. Well, that becomes a disruption, right? Because if all of a sudden you have an invention, a technical invention that disintermediates your entire profit stream, you now have a disruptive problem, right? We made a corporate decision at that point that we needed to move to the future and not stick with the past. We moved to putting data on tape. Well, when you have data on magnetic tape, you start to need electrical, electronic computers to read the data off the tapes and it started to usher in an era of programmable computers, electronic programmable computers that became general purpose business tools. Now, in 1960-ish, IBM made a bet. Again, it's one of those disruptive bets. During the 1950s, everybody was building computers that were special purpose for every program. Everything was different. There was no general programming models. The CEO of the company at the time, Thomas Watson Jr., bet the corporation on the creation of something called the IBM 360. It was a $5 billion bet in 1960 dollars, right? If it hadn't worked, IBM wouldn't have, wouldn't have made it. So he bet the entire corporation on the success of this product, right? This was going to be the first architected, integrated, generally programmable product for business. Right? How many people have ever used an IBM mainframe in here? few handles. How many people have ever used an ATM machine? How many people buy an airline ticket? How many people have used a cash register? All, right. All of those are going through IBM mainframes today. All right. So the bet paid off. He built an enduring legacy and in fact what took that entire room at that point in time now fits inside your iPhone from a computing power viewpoint and the modern mainframe which we released last month looks something like that, All right? That is what runs the world's financial infrastructure, the credit card infrastructures, airline reservation systems. It's the back end processing that supports all of those things. You don't see the IBM brand all over it. We didn't put brands on the ATM machine saying powered by IBM, All right? But behind the scenes, that business has endured over a very long period of time. But that business continued during that time period to get smaller. Computers became personal. Over time, they became mobile, right? The devices you're carrying around now that access the internet. That was really the second generation of computing, 
right? Generally programmable systems. Those mainframe systems of the 1960s, what, the same model exists in everything we use today. They just became smaller, faster, and better connected. That's what we've been innovating on. We've been engineering computers to be smaller, better connected, faster, connected to data all over the world, but that's all we've been doing. But we're now starting to enter a new era, an era that is going to be characterized by a set of technologies that are going to challenge the fundamental premises of the previous generations. Right? The premise of tabulating equipment was that you counted things, and when you counted the same things over and over again, you always came up with the same answer. Right? That's how we came to trust the banking systems and the financial systems. Programmable computers followed the same paradigm. Once you wrote the program and got all the bugs out of it and ran the program against the same set of data, you would get basically the same answers over and over again. Right? And that's why it works so well for the things we do with it today. The next generation of systems are not going to be programmed. They're going to be taught. We're going to have learning systems that can understand information in a similar mechanism to the way we understand information. They're going to be probabilistic as they simulate reasoning and think about how problems can be solved based on an ever-increasing amount of data. Right? We introduced this technology. This was the continuum that I talked about. We introduced this technology with a simple premise. And that simple premise was that we were going to create a partnership between humans and machines to deal with the acceleration of information production. Right? The problem that we have in the industry today is that professions are under siege because the amount of information being produced has overwhelmed the ability of the humans in that profession to consume it. Right? That's an important concept. Right? So this isn't about automating things that we do. This is about creating tools to do things we can't do. Right? In the medical profession, there are 700,000 documents published every year. Research studies, clinical trials, drug trials, new procedures, um, new research innovations, new best practices on how to treat certain diseases. 700,000. How much time do you think your doctor has to read 700,000 documents a year? as they're seeing seven to eight patients an hour paying off their med school loans. They read a few hundred, not a few hundred thousand, a few hundred. There's a huge information gap between what's being discovered and what's being used. Right? These next generation systems are going to start to help us deal with that information to become new tools that help us use that information to make better decisions. We introduced this technology on the game show Jeopardy. All right, how many people saw the Jeopardy match? Fair number. All right, so um, I've been accused many times of this being an incredibly good marketing gimmick that we pulled off. And in fact, it had nothing to do with marketing. What happened here goes back to that story of 1948, 1947, when those generally programmable computers were created. A gentleman by the name of von Neumann, who created the original computer architecture, the binary zero and one that's the basis of all of our computer systems today, made a statement that someday computers will be able to answer any question. And for the next 60 years, people were trying to figure out what he meant, right? Because they couldn't. And it became known in computer science as the open domain deep Q&A problem, right? A very technical name, but open domain, any subject, deep questions, on any topic, right? A group of researchers in IBM got together in 2007 and they decided that they wanted to work on the open domain deep Q&A problem. And so they worked on it for a couple of years. They came up with an approach. They came out and said, we think we have a way to do this, but we're afraid that when we do it, no one will agree we solved the problem, all right? Like all academic problems, right? You have to get everybody to agree on the solution. So they held a colloquium. They brought in academics from all over the world. Um, and everybody agreed during that conference, if someone could build a system that could compete on the game show Jeopardy against the world's best, that would be an adequate proof that the problem had a solution. 
So that's how Jeopardy came to be. So we started working with um, Sony. We had to negotiate the rights to, to play the game. They had a few conditions. Uh, one of the conditions was the system could not be connected to the internet. So it had to be a standalone knowledge base. The second condition, which was kind of funny, was they agreed that Watson should be able to read the question electronically the same way because we read at light speed as we see it. Um, but they insisted that Watson had to press a mechanical thumb in order to answer a question. So we had to build a robotic mechanical thumb to actually um, buzzer in on the questions. Uh, we played the game against two of the, the, the best champions in the world. And what was interesting is there's a point at the very beginning of the match, if you watch it on YouTube, where Brad and Ken look at each other with kind of a puzzled expression. Because the system they were playing on air was different than the one they had tested with six months before. It was behaving differently. It was the same system, but what they realized is what we had been talking about had actually happened. It was a learning system that was continually getting better. Right? So it got smarter and smarter, faster and faster at problem solving and coming up with answers. Now, what happened after the Jeopardy match was interesting is at the bottom of the screen in the Jeopardy match, there was a little box that showed the top three answers and a confidence level. Uh, we started getting phone calls from doctors afterwards wanting to understand. They didn't really care about the Jeopardy match. They thought it was kind of fun to watch. But what they wanted to know is how we came up with that little box. Where did that list come from, and how did we calculate the confidence levels? Right. Those confidence levels were calculated based on evidence, we told them. And they said, ah. And they said, well, how many answers do you have? And we said, we have thousands, because right? we parallel process thousands of possible answers. We rank order <laughs> with machine learning algorithms to figure out what the best are. And they looked at it and said, ah, you have a list of a hypothesis supported by evidence. And we said, yeah. And they said, that's what we do. That's what doctors do every day. They look at evidence, they compare it to their knowledge, they generate a list of hypotheses about what might be wrong with the patients they're looking at. All right. So they thought here could be something of a solution to their problem. Because doctors can't read those 700,000 pages of information. They can read a couple hundred. They're paranoid that they're missing something. So what they want is a tool that can help automate their business process of reading all of that information so that they have better knowledge to serve their patients with. That was an interesting revelation in the beginnings of a commercialization project with Watson. Last January, we announced that we were going to create a commercial division around this after two years of what I would call classic startup incubation. Um, I built a lab in Austin, Texas right after the Jeopardy match. I put the code and a small team down there. And one of the things you do in large corporations is you try to keep everybody out when you're doing this. So we kind of built a moat around them. We didn't let anybody get access to them. And they had time to actually operate like they were operating in TechArb. All right. They could do customer experimentation. They had to do a lot of technology evolution over time. At the end of those two years, we had a half a dozen customers that had partnered with us to help us understand both the healthcare and financial services worlds. Uh, we made the decision it was time to commercialize. And we decided to open up the platform. We launched a new group at the beginning of last year, which we don't do very often, uh, a large standalone group. Um, they gave me a little bit of seed funding to get going with, a um, billion dollars. Um, I know it's tough, um, but it, it's, we're making it work. Um, they, uh, we decided that we were going to make a statement about the creation of the new group, and we were going to create a new headquarters on the edge of the East Village in New York City in a part of the city known as Silicon Alley, which is the startup area of town. All right, typically, IBM's headquarters has always been down on, in Midtown by all the banks and large corporations. We built a new, organi uh, a new organization and a new headquarters, a new structure, a new way of dealing with clients. Um, and we set up the organization so that it was different than the other parts of IBM. It was an organizational change model as well as a new business, right? We vertically integrated consulting, sales, marketing, research, development, uh, delivery, cloud, infrastructure, everything into one unit, gave us um, autonomous control. We took it out of the IBM management system, 
so that I reported to a board uh, that was our CEO and CFO and a few other of my colleagues sat on. Uh, and we had monthly workout sessions last year to figure out the progression of the business as we got going. It's a classic startup kind of mode, but doing a startup at scale, right? Um, accumulating hundreds of clients and partners over a very short period of time in order to get the business started. Now, one of the things that we recognized is that this technology, this idea of learning systems or so-called artificial intelligence was going to scare people, right? And we needed to come up with a way to start to help people understand that the technology was really about people and professions and helping them understand the information that's being produced around them. An interesting factoid is that 90% of the world's data and information has been created in the last 24 months. That's the rate and pace of information creation that we as humans cannot deal with. We need technology that's gonna help us deal with that information to sort through it. We need to understand that that information becomes critical and disruptive to many professions within various industries. Some of the ones we've targeted initially are doctors. Not the billing systems and the record keeping systems, but how do we help doctors provide better care for their patients based on all that information that's being created? We're looking at law. How can you actually disrupt the legal profession if you have systems that can read everything about every court case, every law, every precedent, every decision, pulling all that information together to become an assistive technology for a new generation of lawyers. We're looking at education and how do you take the best practices of the best teachers and create a system that can be a guide or a mentor for teachers all over the world to help them learn from the best mentors possible. Those are just examples of the type of technology we think this is. Now, how do you make money at it becomes an interesting aspect of what it is. IBM is not a charity. Um, I do have to pay back the billion dollars and more over time. But we came up with the idea that as a startup that's well-funded in a large corporation, we could actually do something that most startups can't do, which is to execute three business models in parallel. All right, and we have came up with three approaches to the market, three different business models, three different revenue capture models. The first model was a partnership model to look for industries that were gonna go through massive transformation and disruption, massive transformation and disruption, and partner with professionals in those industries to create products that will revolutionize how those industries create. So those are kind of joint ventures or partnership models, royalty sharing models, et cetera. There's a set of products that we think are gonna be produced that are just replicable software products that are easily consumable uh, by organizations, uh, software as a service kind of pricing models. You know. um, and then third, we recognize when we look in the mirror that IBM is a B2B company. We help businesses apply technology to solve business process problems. That's the core value proposition of the company, always has been, always will be. But we recognize that cognitive technologies were gonna change the way consumers use technologies as well. And we had to come up with a strategy on how to make this technology available to the consumer world. And the way we did that was by creating an ecosystem platform, opening up the APIs and giving access to entrepreneurs like you for free to use the system to build applications. If you're successful, I get a cut. If you're not, we both wasted time, right? Um, but that's okay, all right? That's how you get started, all right? Um, so these are the three core business models. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we'll start looking at transformation first. Um, one of the interesting projects we started last year, we announced in March, was a partnership with the New York Genome Center. They're doing whole genomic sequencing of the human DNA, all right? So they're sequencing something that looks like this, all right? 800 billion pairs of genes, 800 billion pairs, right? We feed this into Watson. 
Watson translates it into something that looks like this. All right, what this is, it's, it's taking out all of the normal genes, keeping the mutated genes and the associated pathways to reach those mutated genes. Then it's taking that information and comparing it against a reference database of all known medical science, identifying drugs that operate on those specific mutated genes automatically. It's using, basically we fed in uh, PubMed, which is 23 million documents of medical reference information into the system. And it automatically identifies those red dots that you see up there on some of the pathways. Those are existing drugs that are known to operate on those particular mutations of that particular gene in that particular human. It would take 30 doctors, 30 days to do what I just showed on those two screens. Watson does it in nine minutes. So why is 30 days to nine minutes important? This study is on glioblastoma, which is a very aggressive brain cancer. Typical duration of from Diagnosis to death is 12 months. 30 days is a very long time, right? So if you can do it in nine minutes, you can identify drugs that can operate on those genes that fast, maybe we can start to alter the course of the disease. That's the experiment we're in. That's what I mean by transformative, big solutions, right? Regular solutions that you would sell that are pre-packaged, pre-information, um, Three products in market right now. Watson for Oncology, which is a decision support product we jointly built with Memorial Sloan Kettering to deliver to oncologists to help them create treatment plans automatically based on patients and the best information in medical science today. Right? This is going into production in Southeast Asia as we speak. Uh, wealth management. One of the things that wealth managers do after you guys build your startups and you make a lot of money and you have all this money, uh, you have to figure out how to manage it. Wealth managers try to help you manage it so they can extract transaction fees, but they don't know what to talk to you about. Now we can personalize that based on everything going on in the market, everything that's interesting about you as an individual and your desires on the kinds of things you might want to invest in can be fed into the system to get personalized recommendations to figure out what that wealth manager might want to call you about and how they might want to help you make better investment decisions. And then Chef Watson was something we created along the lines of the Jeopardy match to introduce a new type of technology called discovery. All right, so think of Jeopardy as introducing question and answer technology. This is technology that introduces the concept of ex exploration and creativity in the white space. So you feed the system with a lot of information about a particular domain and the tools help you find the places that haven't been explored yet. Think of the applicability to drug discovery, right? So what we did for a consumerish kind of explanation is we created a chef. We trained the system on the chemical composition of ingredients, understanding what chemicals interact with which other chemicals to create pleasing tastes in different, di in different types of cooking, right? French, Tex-Mex, Chinese, Japanese, et cetera. Um, <coughs> Then we train the system on 9,000 recipes from Bon Appetit. So now it generates unusual combinations of ingredients and the recipes that support it to try to cook. I've had to sample most of them. I can guarantee it's a learning system um, because the early recipes were so-so. They're actually quite good right now. We actually published a cookbook that's available on Amazon, something I never thought I'd do in my IBM career is to publish a cookbook, but it's, uh, it's available as uh, Cognitive Cooking with Chef Watson, right? Um, and then third is the ecosystem, which is where you come in. We decided to open up the capability of our R&D labs to publish APIs on a platform in the cloud that enabled entrepreneurs to get access to state-of-the-art technology that they could start building applications right away. We had to build this ecosystem, right? We launched it. In January of last year, we had three brave partners that had helped us work out the kinks. Um, we had 160 active developers on the platform in December. That was only limited by uh, the amount of cloud capacity I had to give them instances of Watson. We had 3,000 partners trying to get on the platform last year. So we've ramped that up this year as we've added the APIs to our Bluemix platform. 
right? We've started making Watson available through resellers, and we've opened it up to universities. Actually here at the University of Michigan, Eric Mickelson um, was meeting with me last February and he said, you should teach a class on Watson. People would fill it up, all right? We said, that's a good idea. By the time I got home that night in New York, one of the Jeopardy creators and I had designed a class um, to be taught. Three weeks later, we had 10 universities signed up to teach that class last fall, right? Which is record time in academia to get something into a course catalog, right? <laughs> 10, 10 universities, little universities like Michigan, Ohio State, Northwestern, University of Toronto, uh, University of Texas, Austin, Stanford, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, NYU, RPI, medium schools, right? They taught the class. The best ideas actually were brought together for a contest um, in January. Um, and the schools competed against each other for $100,000 of startup funding. Um, that competition went pretty well. Uh, Michigan showed well, but didn't place, I guess is the, the right terminology. We're in the middle of the pack. Uh, the team here under Dave Chesney picked an enormously complex problem to work on um, around a very difficult part of medicine, which is the most complex kind of solution to build. Some of the other teams picked a little bit easier domain uh, and built some really compelling solutions, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes. Um, these are the partners that are lined up right now, right? Lots of them. Interesting companies. Some old school ISVs that have adopted cognitive technologies. Most of these are startups. This is one that won an award at the Computer Electronics Show last month, uh, the beginning of January. Um, it's a company called LifeLearn. They built a product called Sophie. Sophie is a diagnostic assistant for veterinarians to help veterinarians diagnose what's wrong with your dog and your cat. Right? It's a great application. It's using the same concepts that we used in the oncology project, but to focus on a completely different domain. How many people know who Terry Jones is? Famous entrepreneur. You've used his companies. He's the creator of Travelocity and the founder of Kayak. Right? You might have used those tools to make airline reservations at some point in time. Terry was retired on the speaker tour, enjoying life. Uh, he saw the Watson technology and he came out of retirement, launched a new company about three months ago called Wayblazer. Um, what he decided was with Watson, he could actually fix a problem with Travelocity and Kayak. The thing that got left behind was the person that had sat on that beach, ate in that restaurant, been in that hotel room, been on that cruise ship, the travel agent, right? He automated the transaction processing side of travel with Travelocity and Kayak, but you lost the experience of the travel agent, the person that advised you on what to do. So he's building a company that now creates the virtual travel agent that knows you, understands you, understands what you like, and can make recommendations for you on what you want to do on your vacation. Right? One of his dirty little secrets he told when he started this is, even though he created Travelocity and Kayak, when he goes on vacation, he calls a travel agent. He missed that. So now he's building that with Boyblazer. My name is Bree Conley. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. We built an app to change the way call centers work. So instead of having to talk to a human operator, you can ask questions to Watson. I actually loved Watson when I was in high school because I wa the only episode of Jeopardy I've ever seen is that episode that Watson was on. When a computer's on, I'm like, oh, it's pretty cool. I actually watch it. Watson, who is Franz Liszt? You are right. What is violin? Good. Who is the church lady? Yes. <laughs> So I always thought like, man, I really want to work on this someday. So I was like, oh, look, I'm working on the thing that I thought was really cool. Really helped motivate me to get into this field, man. Yeah, when I was in high school watching Watson on Jeopardy, I, I mean, I knew I wanted to do something like that, but I had no idea I would actually be working with Watson uh, within just a few years, actually, after that. Uh, it's been, it's a pretty incredible experience. I think Watson is unique in the sense that data scientists can finally focus on the application because Watson is doing the heavy lifting. And coming from an academic perspective, it's so refreshing because finally, you know, we have this long list of problems that we want to work on, 
uh, and we don't have to sit down and start from scratch and writing the algorithms. I think that is how Watson is going to transform business. Watson is going to deliver data science as a service. I think that's pretty revolutionary. I'm pretty excited. I think I honestly think we have a good chance. Um, we put so much work into it though, and no matter what, um, it's not necessarily just about the competition anymore. It's about more than that. So what, we're happy with what we've done and what we've been able to do for our community. Um, so ultimately that is like, it's kind of like we already won in a way and this competition is just the icing on the cake. And the winner is University of Texas. There was kind of an initial shock of what can Watson really do? Um, and we really kind of just discovered that Watson can do as much as you can make Watson do. So what are the lessons learned about doing a startup in a large corporation? They're very similar to the lessons that you do um, when you're doing a startup in an incubator. Um, you just have a little bit more access to resource, right? Um, but what's been interesting, uh, my colleagues and, and my boss, Ginny, um, actually held us to the concept of we needed to be self-contained. We needed to understand how uh, startups really worked because we needed to act like them and think like them and make decisions like them. So we looked at how to do this. So we realized that we couldn't do it alone. We needed to create an ecosystem around us of people, of skills, of ambassadors. We were a small part of IBM. There's 400,000 employees. We were 1,000 at the time, right? How did we leverage that? So we created the Watson University internally. We had a MOOC inside that allowed people to get smart on Watson. If they passed the test, they got a social badge. They became a Watson ambassador. We enrolled 80,000 other people in the company to help us build our business without having to pay for them, right? The same logic can apply to the startup world, is how do you actually reach out and get people to do work for you for nothing? It's an acronym that I try to get my team to live on every single day called OPM, other people's money, right? If you're gonna be successful in a large corporation, doing a startup or doing a startup in the real world, you have gotta figure out how to leverage other people's money, right? We had to build this for speed. One of the things we did on my very first management meeting is say we we're gonna operate on what we called Watson time. Every day was a week, every week was a month, every month was a quarter, every quarter was a year. My team thought I was talking about speed. <coughs> By the end of the year, they realized I was talking about volume. Right. By the end of the year, we'd done what we normally would have done in four years. Right. So speed and volume were important. Um, we changed every rules. We changed all the HR systems. Right. One of the inviolate things in a large corporation you can never do is change the processes around human resources. We changed them all. We can change the employee evaluation system. We changed everything. We broke any rule that we didn't get yelled at for. That was kind of the logic. Break the rule and see if you get yelled at. Right? If you don't, then keep going. Right? So the logic is that applies whether you're inside or outside a corporation. You have to stay legal. You have to do things that are ethical. But don't assume that the way things have always been done are correct. You have to change the paradigms that you're operating within. Right? We had a fail fast mentality. Try things, fail, pick up, redo. Right? It's the way you have to operate as a startup. So where is this all going? Hello, my name is Newton. I'll run the Watson Labs in Austin, Texas. One of my team members sent me a picture of the robot and I said buy four. We bought four and since then we've had them in the labs and they've been just really fun to work with. The robot allows uh, us to have a very human connection to Watson. Watson and most technologies in the industry are hard to explain. So when you have a robot and you show the robot doing something, it's a connection that's made. Uh, and it's just, that in itself is very powerful and we take advantage of that. So Watson is, is in fact working as the brain for the robots. Uh, the speech technologies, the question answering uh, components, the vision components, uh, these are all Watson services and a platform that we're using to enable Watson to have a very cognitive and real life experience. And the way you interact with, with uh, these robots is they have speakers and microphones. So the way I characterize it is we talk to the robots and they talk back and watch them, uh, helps them understand what was said to them and helps them figure out what to, what to say. Are you excited, Naomi? Yes, very excited. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh. Everybody who looks at the robots uh, loves them and smiles. And it creates an interesting interaction that doesn't exist with any other system. So for us, it's a gold mine of opportunity to create a cognitive experience with Watson. I am the future of cognitive computing. So on Monday of this week, I was in Japan announcing uh, the partnership with SoftBank, who is the owners of the company that built these robots. I want to leave you with one final story as Tom comes back on stage. Many might think robots, humanoid robots, are we really there yet? We're close. But let me give you an example of three kids in New York City that did a startup last year. We ran a, another contest. We like contests are great ways to use other people's money. All you have to do is put up the prize money and everybody does not work. Um, they built a stuffed animal. That was their application. They sat it down on the table and said, here's our Watson application. And we said, what? Seriously? It's a stuffed animal. And they said, well, what does it do? He said, well, what do children do with stuffed animals and their toys? They talk to them. And we said, yeah. And they said, well, this one talks back. And we said, okay, talking toy. It's been around a while. <laughs> right? um, they said, you don't understand. This one talks back, and it's actually Watson talking back. And therefore, we can keep track of the conversation. This is where we got a little creeped out. Right, because um, you now you've got you know two-year-olds talking to toys and Watson monitoring the conversation. It gets a little creepy. And we said, well, what do you do with that? And they said, well, when you think about it, if you can monitor the conversation and the development of language between a child and a toy, you can actually check their developmental progress using analytics. So the parents can actually have a monitor on their iPad that starts to point out things like dyslexia, learning disabilities, language development disabilities, right? I never would have thought of that. That's why you guys are here. That's why we're opening up Watson to entrepreneurs, because you're going to come up with those kind of ideas. All right. Tom? Mike, normally I love the Q&A section of the class, but after a lecture like that, I feel like you should just take the hand mic, yell boom, drop it on the stage, and walk off. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, have a seat. So we only have a couple times for Q&A, so I'm going to ask the most important one first. We've all seen the movie. We know the robots win, and it ends very badly for <laughs> humanity. So where is your secret bunker, and how do we all gain access before we're devastated by the robots? It, it won't be secret if I tell you. <laughs> Duly right. noted. Right. Um, guys, I have a chance, and I know Mike. Is, are there people out there that have questions that would like a chance or a shot today? other than me? I thought there would be. I see firsthand there, up and go. Um, I think the, the interesting, the, 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 I guess the best way to describe it is, I've, I've been in one, play, in one company for 30 years. I've changed jobs every two to three years. So I, I've had you know, what many people would have as 10 different careers, but I have access to um, research technology that I can't get outside, right? We've got one of the um, most important research laboratories in the world inside IBM. They come up with innovations like Watson, and I get to figure out how to commercialize them. So um, I, I think the simple thing was is I've had a lot of fun. I haven't had a reason to leave, right? I think the other thing, and we're not going to have time to do it justice, so we're going to ask Mike to come back again. But Mike has acquired, what, between 80 to 100 companies in your tenure at IBM? I've been part of the team that acquired over 100 companies. I've done over 30. So when you think about exits for startups, when you think about M&A work, he's been working with startups, acquiring startups, figuring out how to integrate startups uh, before that was even a cool activity. Other questions? Hand, I see one right there. Go. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the best analogy on that is if you go back to the 50s and think about the financial services industry, um, banks were local, regional meant county banks, right? There were no national banks, there were no international banks, there were no international monetary funds, there were no credit cards, none of that stuff existed. There was a profession called bookkeepers, and they actually kept books and they wrote your balances out and those books were stored in the vaults. Um, computers automated all of what bookkeepers did. There are more people employed in the financial services industry today than there ever were then, right? So what happens is as tools help humans automate certain tasks, humans migrate to higher value. It happens all the time. New professions happen, new jobs happen. Most of the jobs in the financial services industry did not even, weren't even comprehended when that transaction processing systems were put in. 
So what we'll see is that as these systems come in, we'll move to higher value work, right? So as, if you think about call centers and the app that the University of Texas did, what's the biggest problem with call centers in most companies today? It's not employment, right? It's attrition. People hire on, get trained, and quit. It's a revolving door, right? People don't like the repetitive mundane work and they don't stay. It's very costly. So if you can take the repetitive mundane stuff, automate that, then the call center job becomes the more interesting problems, the harder problems, higher value problems. They can get paid more for that work. And what you've done is you've elevated it. You have a better service for your customers and you've created a new class of advisor that works with their customers as opposed to doing mundane stuff. The other thing that IBM and Mike are involved in um, is that you know, IBM has a sense of they have responsibility for impact. They've actually started creating a new world-class high school model designed to, in fact, train and graduate students in, in many cases in low-income, underprivileged areas so that they come out with the skill set to actually be employable. In the, at, new, in the new era. In the new era, as opposed to just intermediating jobs. It's, it's a school called p -Tech that started in Brooklyn. It's now being replicated across the country. Question on the other side? Other, next question? There was Somebody snapping here. their hand? Sorry, uh, yeah. up at the top, go. Um, it's available on a, um, on a cloud called Bluemix, which is IBM's platform as a service. Think of that as IBM's version of AWS. Um, so the APIs for Watson are in the Watson developer zone on there. Uh, so you can get access if you go look up Bluemix and Watson online, you can find your way to it. But one of the things Tom and I are working on is figuring out how to actually line it up here with TechArb in town so that the, the entrepreneurs in town want to get access to it. We'll have it kind of the skids greased for making it easy to get access to it here locally. Uh, right now it's English. On Monday I announced that we're teaching it to speak Japanese. No, I mean like, like for the API, like it's a standard REST-based API, so you can get at it from any of the uh, services. Okay, we have time for one more. All, all the, the way the in the back, all the way at the top. Yell it out. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was just waving. Oh, drowning, not waving. Yeah. Um, all right, you guys, uh, the last attendance questions for those of you who can stay today are part of the discovery, customer discovery process for one of the teams from the startup. Next week, we have our battle cage match. So come on back because your vote might save someone's life. The other thing is we have not talked about the book in a while. But if you haven't read the book, please try and keep up with your reading. It's a light assignment. We're going to be incorporating the book into some of the upcoming classes. Let's give Mike one more round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. But who does that anymore, right? That's not the way business really works. You have to be able to adapt to the changing market forces and the changing needs of your customers.